Okay, we're back. Uh, this is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. We're live here at IBM IOD. Think big is the mantra of this conference, and uh, we've been thinking fast, thinking big, and uh, this is a fantastic event, IBM's premier you know, software event, the information management group, but it's really morphed into a big data event. Uh, IBM staking its claim and grabbing its piece of the big data pie, a leader, if not the leader, in big data. And uh, so this is Dave Vellante, this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage, our flagship coverage of events. We go out to these events, we extract the signal from the noise, we bring the smartest people we can find uh, to you, share with you, our audience, uh, the insights that we've learned, that we're learning at these events. I'm here with my co-host, I'm Jeff Kelly from Wikibon.org, and we're here uh, our next, with our next guest, Thomas Jackman, uh, from the Desert Research Institute. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. So you're an associate research professor uh, for advanced visualization, computation, and modeling. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, DRI, and uh, then we'll go into some of the, some of the things you're doing with uh, IBM's big data uh, portfolio. Okay. Well, uh, the conference here is in Las Vegas, here in the state of Nevada, and um, we're with the university system, the system of higher education for the state of Nevada. There are two university campuses and there's a research institute. DRI is the research arm of, for the state of Nevada. It's an environmental uh, sciences and engineering research institute. Mm -hmm. And we do environmental monitoring, field studies, data collection, uh, for monitoring resources, natural resources, mm -hmm. weather, uh, climate, pollution. So you get a lot of data. Yes, we have lots <laughs> of data. I was thinking, that, that is a lot so, of data that you need to collect to and, do that work. Uh, diverse sets of data. So, um, Thomas, talk about what your data life was like, you know, a few years ago. I'll go back as you know, far as you want, you know, five years, seven years, whatever, decade and what it's like today, and how you're dealing with that, and what kind of value you're getting out of that data. How has well, that changed? So, what's happening is, obviously our data just sort of grew, right? There was no, there was no strategy that, you know, where it's going to grow a lot more, and here's what we're going to do. So you arrive at a point in your IT, sort of an infrastructure, and you say, wow, we have a problem. And so, what we have to do is we have to start centralizing our data. We have to be aware of the different types of data. We need to be able to access the data in real time. And we need to analyze it better. And so, we're just starting on the road of partnering with IBM. And we're planning to have IBM Pure Systems deployed at DRI, where we can start using the data, deploying the data, and analyzing the data better. So what are your objectives with the, with the data? What are, you, what are you trying to get to? What's the end game? So, obviously we need to monitor our natural resources better. So automation, supervised monitoring for the environment, monitoring power grids, um, renewable energy, weather, weather forecasting, emergency, emergency preparedness. So all this data, getting the data, collecting the data, analyzing the data, then helping public policy people, legislators, mm -hmm. emergency responders, other scientists, and businesses. How are you guys funded? Ah, that's interesting. So we're an academic institution. DRI is a very unusual in that most of ours is not coming from the state. Most of our funding comes from contracts. So grants and contracts that we develop is how we're mostly funded. So you got you to earn your That's uh, correct, your, that's your way. exactly the way it is. Okay, yes. so that means that you've really got to align with what people want, you got to create value. We have to create value. Yeah, so that's an interesting you know, organizational model. So, and that actually thing. is the new model. I think yeah. we're all thinking that the uh, the academic institution of the future has got to be prepared for less dependence on federal funding. And we're going to have to be looking for partnerships with industry um, and companies, uh, local companies. So, um, well hopefully you're getting the pure data, pure systems, uh, giant academic institution discount <laughs> uh, from IBM. <laughs> yeah. And a uh, little 
little little little plug there for that uh, for the IBM sales reps. But talk about um, you guys are scientists. Right. Uh, there's a big term now in the industry: data science, Wikibon, and right. SiliconANGLE. We've done all kinds of cool infographics on on data science. One of the first data scientists. You know, new breed data scientist we, I, I met was Hillary Mason of Bitly. We've had Jeff Hammerbacher on, who, who kind of coined the, the nouveau term data science. Um, are you guys data scientists? What's going on in, in your world? What does data science mean to DRI? Well, I run the center for, we call it CAVCAM. And we do high performance computing, advanced visualization. We actually have a virtual reality, a six-sided virtual reality, uh, environment, which allows us to sort of create natural environments and sort of bring in our data sets and look at things that you wouldn't be able to look at otherwise. So to actually experience things like Lake Tahoe and to be able to see soil moisture, temperature, vulnerability to wildfires, we're able to see these things. And so this is perhaps a new interface for looking at data and using it and interacting with it. So it's kind of, is it a simulation uh, it type a of simulation. model? So you can test what if scenarios and, and things like that. Interesting, so uh, how do you take that from um, you know, doing some interesting simulations and, and taking your findings though and turning, turning those into actions that uh, help the community, help, help the environment, the business community, and your other uh, stakeholders? So that is, um, that is part of the science, actually validating that these models um, uh, are true, uh, ground truthing these things, um, and data is, of course, the requirement for that. So we are bringing the process in. Of course, everyone is, has concerns about simulation. You know, um, how real is it? Uh, is graphics involved? So lots of graphics involved. So is it movie or is it real? And so bringing people in, convincing them that they can do training inside this. Um, so wildfire training, for example. Um, all sorts of emergency preparedness. Mm -hmm. So these are the types of things we can so do. So I think about, uh, Thomas, I think about fraud detection. So fraud yeah. detection used to be a, 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 a game of sampling. Yeah. You take you know, little, little bits of sample, or maybe a lot of sample, yeah. and then you'd you know, mine the data, you'd build a model, make some assumptions, and six months later you might find that some fraud was committed, you'd go back in and, and try to you know, rectify it. And then that's really changed quite dramatically in the financial services business where sampling is dead, and ingest the, you know, the entire data stream and then within, I don't know, maybe not minutes, but certainly hours they can identify, and sometimes minutes, right. identify fraud. Right. You've got a different problem in terms of the, the predictive abilities and the, the complexities of the model. Think about weather. That's right. Um, but talk about how um, things are changing, or are they changing in terms of sampling, how your models are changing, are they becoming more obviously more data heavy, but in proportion? Are you relying more on the data, or is the data helping calibrate the models? Help us squint through that. So the same ideas that one might use in investment banking, you look back to predict the future. So the more data you have from the past, the better you can actually predict the future. And so with, for example, climate models, you can sort of look at data from historically over the past, parameterize your models, create probability distributions, and then run, run models going forward in time. Not too dissimilar from what high frequency trading uh, uses. Right. Um, we can also start capturing data in real time. So actually imagining that we're having streaming data, we can start monitoring renewable energy resources, for example. Um, photovoltaic arrays, wind farms, monitoring that data in real time. Because you, in that particular case, you have to match demand response um, in usage of electric power to what nature is producing for you. And so you have to know that. Um, and if you, and if the energy providers have to integrate this into the grid, well they need to know this and they need to know it as early as possible. Yeah, so what is, uh we always have this conversation, what's real time? And sometimes, you know, in, in certain worlds, in the advertising world, real time is before you lose the customer. Yeah, right. You know, what is real time in, in, in your world? Well, there are many different worlds, right? It, in, in climate, real world can be 15 minutes, could be an hour. 
in renewable energy, for example, real time is now, and perhaps you'd need to know every 1 60th of a second. Um, the grid needs to be monitored every 1 60th of a second. We run at 60 hertz. So we need to know this very, we need to know it very accurately. There's lots of data that could potentially be streamed in. So we have problems of size and speed. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned earlier, you, you know, you, as, as you kind of were taking this journey, you hit a, hit a, hit a roadblock. Yeah. You realize at some point, well, we have a problem here. We didn't yeah. plan for this kind of data explosion and the different right. types of data. Uh, so, could you go into that a little bit more? What was the roadblock? Was it the, you were having performance issues? Was it right. having, you just overwhelmed by the amount of data, didn't know, uh, felt like you, maybe you were missing, missing things? What was that moment where you said, we, we need to really start thinking about this in a different way? Well, we, we are an academic institution. We're not perhaps much like an investment bank where everything would be strategically planned. Mm -hmm. So our data grows because individual scientists collect more and more data. And, it, and you just keep adding more hard drives and you, and you eventually get to a point you say, we can't do this individually. We have to start centralizing our resources and sharing our resources better. Mm -hmm. Because it's academia, we don't necessarily use we use custom approaches, not necessarily enterprise ready approaches. And so what we're embarking on is using the same strategy of, of Wall Street and using it in the academic research environment to do better, more sophisticated data management um, and preparing for the future. So that's also going to require a uh, you know a cultural shift in some sense in your organization. So yeah. how are you tackling that? I mean, the idea of treating data yeah. as an asset and that's as a right. centralized service is much different from individual scientists. They got their you know maybe a few hard drives. They got their data. Right. Not necessarily concerned what's happening over here. Right. It brings into questions about data policy and management. Right. Um, so how are you addressing some of those issues, both technically and culturally, changing the thinking? So the scientists um, are all coming along willingly. I think mm -hmm. everyone is recognizing that there is a problem. And so, in terms of this proof of concept, um, we're having lots of interest to participate, lots of people willing to try moving their data to an enterprise-ready type platform, to start looking at enterprise-ready type databases and data management strategy. So, I think probably only a year ago, we would have had a lot of convincing to do, but we're starting to see people who are just becoming far more interested and uh, prepared to, for the next step. Well, people become very attached to their data. That's right. And it's sometimes we are very reluctant to you know, put that into a shared, shared system that happens in the enterprise, right. obviously happening in so academia as well. The, the hard part is they have to keep devoting more and more time to supporting that data. Mm -hmm. And so having a shared service to do that is a big win for everyone. Absolutely. I would say this whole concept of big data changed your thinking and your point of view on data sources. Um, yeah. Is the data that you're using, was it, was it all there internally or were these sort of new big data technologies, you know, thinking bigger? Right. Uh, did you start to look outside the four walls of your organization? How, talk about that dynamic a little bit. So, we have all different types of scientists. We have field scientists, we have laboratory scientists, we have computational scientists. So, not everyone would have even classified what they had as data. You know, it's information, it's lab records, it's, it's spectrographs, it's, it's remote sensing, it's aerial photography. Um, so these are all different types of data sets. How do they all get geo-referenced? How do they get correlated? How can you start bringing them together and making decisions, actionable decisions, based on all this? In the past, they were separate data sets, and now we have the capability to start bringing it all together. And so it's getting exciting, and I think that, that academia is actually ready and prepared to also start adopting this strategy for data. I think that's a, that's a turning point. What do you see as your big um, barrier? In other words, what one thing would you change, uh, if you could change, would you know, really accelerate, you know, make your, your 
the, the, your life better, create more value? What's the gate right now? Is it skill sets? Is it technology? Is it process? Is it, you don't know what you don't know? <laughs> uh, I, think, I think technology has been fairly siloed. Um, interestingly enough, when students go and they study engineering, they study science, they're not learning these, these strategies um, right now. Just now in the business schools, they're starting to teach this. But this ha all has to trickle down. So we need the skills in the students who are going to be participating in research studies. So we need these skills to trickle all the way down to the universities and perhaps even to the high schools. So education is probably the biggest thing that's going to start helping big data. Outstanding. So, yeah, so expand on that a little bit. The skills meaning uh, the, the understanding of how data interacts with one another, how data needs to be visualized. What do you mean by what skills particular uh, do you think need to be really built up? Well, um, databases, mm -hmm. um, software engineering, um, engineering, teaching civil engineering about with smart structures where you're thinking about, you have sensors in, in bridges, mm. in buildings, um, teaching renewable energy, where you're thinking about monitoring and starting to predict how much energy you're going to generate. Uh, these, are, these are things that we can start do, teaching in, in the universities, um, and could and should. And so using predictive analytics and introducing that into engineering and science curricula, in addition to bringing in operations management from the business schools. And so having this cross-disciplinary education um, would be really uh, helpful. Exciting times. Uh, Thomas, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. I uh, really appreciate your perspectives and, uh, and good luck with the initiatives. And Thank you. Good luck with the funding and those IBM discounts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, uh, thanks for coming on. Keep it right there. We'll be right back from Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's coverage of IBM's IOD. Keep it right there.